and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast hosted by me, Chad Cooper, and my best buddy in the whole wide world, Mr. Bo Ramsdale. Now, if you're a return listener, welcome back. But if you're new to the podcast, let me show you around the place. Um, over there, that's the whiteboard with all the proposed ideas for new seasons of the show, because each season we pick a theme, and then we select six movies that are all related to that theme. Um, over there... That's the research room and all those uh, super tired looking 20 somethings. Those are the interns. They work on the introductions for each movie that we provide you on each episode. And these introductions are filled with facts and behind the scenes goodies to help you understand the history of the movie that we discuss on each episode. All right, and if you'll follow me over here, this is one of our two recording booths. We have a booth A and a booth B. And this is where Mr. Bo Ransdell and I record the introductions that the interns write and it's also here that Bo and I record reviews of each movie it's just the two of us and we discuss it from start to finish to see if it's any good and we do silly voices and we crack jokes it's quite the good time um oh come here uh this is our editing room the guy inside there is Teddy Teddy's always high uh bathrooms are down the hall they're unisex they're both equally gross um ooh and this, <laughs> this is our prize possession. The Dolly Parton themed pinball machine. Mm -hmm. Playing a little pinball here is one of our interns who legally can't speak on the podcast due to legal and, let's be honest, financial reasons. Um, and this, like all of the sounds going in your ears, well, this is episode five of this season's theme, right in the middle of you, featuring six movies inspired by the writings of Michael Crichton. And boy, have you shown up on an exciting episode because we're reviewing Runaway. It stars Tom Selleck, you know, the guy that your grandma still thinks is sexy. And it's also got Kirstie Alley, you know, the lady that your grandfather thinks is no longer sexy. It's got robots and computers and there's a Gene Simmons running around. Michael Crichton's fingerprints are all over this one. <laughs> oh, and look, here comes Bo. He's gonna go into the recording booth to lay down the audio for this episode's introduction. Hey, just flip a chair real quick. We can, we can listen to it live together. Also, we're going to find out if Bo went into the booth that I filled up with farts earlier today. Nope, thumbs up for Bo. He chose a winner. All right, let's listen to the intro. And uh, stay out of recording booth B. It's full of my farts. It's intro time. One more time for intros. Oh, hey, Bertram. What's the good word? Bertram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Chad is usually the one coming to the studio to record, but I thought I might get out of the home office and see what's happening at P6HQ. Where is everybody anyway? You you gave them the day off. What are we paying you again? Oh, yeah, 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 right. Nothing. And it's worth every penny if you ask me. So what, what's the intro for this week's movie? A robust discussion of military technology or weird stories about fears of heights? Let me see what you have so far. All right. <clears throat> Tom Selleck was a guy with a mustache, and he was Magnum P.I. and had a red Ferrari. That's it? How long have you been working on this? Two weeks? That's a very long time, Bertram. Lay down some 80s music and let me show you how to swing. You know those actors who are eponymous? That means everywhere, Bertram. But despite how everywhere they are, they're not exactly superstars. You know who they are, of course, and by all accounts, they should be a big star, but somehow it never quite happened. Well then, ladies and gentlemen, and Bertram, you know Tom Selleck. For our older listeners and Bertram, you know Tom Selleck as Thomas Magnum, the Aloha shirt-wearing detective from the hit show Magnum P.I. But Tom Selleck was a lot more than that, and almost a whole lot more than that. Tom Selleck is officially a boomer, having been born in 1945. When he was three years old, his family moved to Sherman Oaks, California. His family life seems fairly idyllic. Dad had a good job, mom stayed at home with the kids, all four of them. And then after high school, Tom went to the University of Southern California, where he found some success playing basketball. It probably helped that he was six feet four inches tall. He was going to get his degree in business until an acting coach suggested that Tom try his hand at performing. Just as I'm sure the acting coach intended, a year later Tom Selleck dropped out of college and started studying acting full-time. During his early days as an actor, and since it was 1967, Tom Selleck received his draft notice to go into the army. Thinking fast, 
Tom Selleck joined the National Guard, where he served for six years and achieved the rank of sergeant. Thanks to his good looks, he even showed up on some recruiting posters, though he never went overseas to fight. But who can blame him, right? I mean, Vietnam seems terrible. Whatever you had to do to stay home, do that. His earliest work was on The Dating Game, which he appeared on in 1965 and then again in 1967. After that, he started to land some commercial work. He was in ads for Pepsi and Right Guard Deodorant and the Toothpaste Close-Up. Maybe he was just stinky and dirty and thirsty. But during this time, he also landed a few bit parts in movies, like Myra Breckenridge and The Seven Minutes from the boobalicious director Russ Myers, who also did Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which is maybe one of the top five greatest movie titles ever. With his outdoorsy quality, Tom Selleck also got some parts in westerns, including movies like The Sackets, Concrete Cowboys with Pick Six alum Jerry Reed, and The Shadow Riders. But he hit it really big in 1980. After filming six television pilots in that one year alone, one of them got some traction. And it was about a former Navy officer who retired to Hawaii and became a private investigator. The show was called Magnum P.I., and Tom Selleck was the lead, Thomas Magnum. It was in this role that Selleck could show off his innate charm and his infectious, almost Reynolds-esque laugh. And that mustache, good lord, that mustache. He became a genuine heartthrob, and for that moment in the 1980s, he was an honest-to-goodness household name, and Magnum P.I. would go on to run for eight years. There was a moment when Selleck was poised to go from household name to Hollywood royalty, to the kind of fame that would have made him a superstar. Steven Spielberg was casting the part of Indiana Jones for a little movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Maybe you've heard of it? But Selleck had a problem. His contract stated he could not act in other projects during the filming of Magnum P.I., and the filming of the Magnum P.I. pilot was delayed by six months because of a writer strike, which meant Tom Selleck could break his contract and be Indiana Jones, or he could remain the tropical detective. About this misconnection, Selleck said, Look, I made a deal with Magnum, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm proud that I lived up to my contract, and some people said, you've got to get into a car and drive into a brick wall and get injured and get out of Magnum and do Raiders. I said, I got to look my mom and dad in the eye, and we don't do that. So I did Magnum. That's not so bad, is it? Hell no, it's not bad. While he played Magnum, he also starred in Runaway, Her Alibi, An Innocent Man, and the monster hit Three Men and a Baby. That's not so bad at all. His biggest non-Magnum role was likely in the Australian set Western, Quigley Down Under. In the 90s, after Magnum wrapped up, he showed up on the mega-hit Friends sitcom, did more commercial work, and ended up starring in a series of detective television movies based around the Robert B. Parker character, Jesse Stone. In his later years, Tom Selleck got the role of Frank Reagan, a police patriarch on the show Blue Bloods, which has been running for 12 years. 12 years. That's not so bad at all. But not exactly the path that Harrison Ford took, who stepped in as Indiana Jones when Tom Selleck declined. It's a fun game to play with yourself, to wonder what might have been if Selleck had put on the jacket and cracked the whip as Indiana Jones, but there's no denying that he has put together an enviable career. Just not maybe a superstar career. And one final note about Senor Selleck, one thing he has become known for is his politics. He is an unabashed conservative. In 1984, he introduced Nancy Reagan at the Republican National Convention. He also assumed the role of spokesperson for the National Rifle Association when Charlton Heston stepped down. He has described himself as, quote, a registered independent with a lot of libertarian leanings. He also said in 2016 he didn't vote for either Clinton or Trump, preferring a write-in candidate police chief who Selleck admired for having handled the 2016 Dallas police shooting. In 1999, Tom Selleck was promoting a movie called The Love Letter, and he went on Rosie O'Donnell's talk show to talk about the film. O'Donnell had different ideas, though, and kept after him about his involvement with the NRA and his stances on gun control. Finally, Selleck said to the host, it's your show, and you can talk about it after I leave. 
Later, he said, mustering much grace, maybe more than I possess, quote, I still like Rosie. I think she needs to take a deep breath and stop thinking everyone who disagrees with her is evil. Damn straight, Mr. Selleck. I may not agree with all of Tom Selleck's politics, but he seems like a decent guy and a far cry from evil. In fact, he seems like a pretty great guy. And I agree with him. Not everyone who disagrees with you is evil. And if more people thought like that, what a wonderful tropical detective paradise we could all have. But now that we have some background on our movie star, let's talk about this movie, Runaway. The most interesting thing about the film is its views on futurism. When asked about the vague time in which the movie takes place, Michael Crichton confirmed that he left the when of the movie intentionally vague, although there are some clues to suggest that the movie takes place around 1991, written and directed from the perspective of someone releasing a movie in 1984. When he was pressed further, he said the, the movie took place about a year from release, which would have been 1985, but that feels a little optimistic, but maybe not crazily so, but we'll get into that. Runaway was released the same year as The Terminator, and in the grand history of killer robot movies, The Terminator assuredly had the greater cultural impact. In fact, it is clear that The Terminator rules and Runaway drills. Wait, what? Bertram, did you write this? That's what I get for relying on these interns, but that lack of Terminator level success doesn't mean Runaway isn't really interesting in this regard, or that it does in fact drool. So let's talk about what the movie gets right. Runaway predicted the use of personal tablets, which the supremely irritating Bobby uses in bed. You probably have to cut the internet off to get him to do his homework too. There are drones called floaters in this movie, but they're drones all right. They have cameras and remote controls and fly around things to propellers, and it's kind of eerie actually. There are video doorbells, as seen when Gene Simmons shows up to leave a message at the front door, and God help you if that ever happens to you. And those come as part of any home security package now. You can get them on Amazon for a few bucks even. And how about self-driving cars? Can you believe that's a real thing now? Runaway called it, although the goofy mannequin in the front seat was a bridge too far, but as for how it works, dead on. Here's one that seems like it should have been real in 1984, but totally wasn't. That remote earpiece Tom Selleck uses when he's negotiating with Gene Simmons for the release of his partner, it's like one of those Bluetooth headsets that became very popular for a while before earbuds rose to rule the earth. Still pretty good, Michael Crichton. Then there's the photo editor, which you see when Johnson is making the composite photo of Gene Simmons. Not exactly Photoshop, but it presages the use of computers to manipulate photos. And to wrap up our tour of things Runaway got right before we talk about how things went oh so wrong, let's talk about smart bullets. Now, to the best of our knowledge, we don't have bullets that can lock onto a unique heat signature and follow someone through pipes, but there are smart bullets. No kidding. Bullets that can literally turn in midair based on laser painted targets and the like. But that's just what we know about. Who's to say that there isn't a bullet like the one described in the film? But close enough that we're going to count it for this conversation. Despite all this undeniably cool futurism that Michael Crichton nailed like some kind of hippie Nostradamus, the movie came out to little fanfare, which is a shame. Michael Crichton wrote the film a few years before he would go on to write his big hit Jurassic Park, but he was certainly established as both a writer of film and a filmmaker, as we discussed with Westworld earlier in the season. He wanted to make a movie that was a stereotypical police story, only one where the use of near future technology tweaked the cliches enough to make it more interesting. Crichton said that the movie was about the difference between man and machine, and worried that the technology and robots of the movie would overshadow the human element. To that end, Crichton landed the aforementioned Tom Selleck to take on the role of Jack Ramsey, our hero of the movie. And this was not the first time that Tom Selleck appeared in a Michael Crichton project. Coma, which was released way back in 1978, was a medical thriller written by the novelist Robin Cook, who happened to be friends with Michael Crichton. Crichton optioned the movie rights of Coma from his friend and developed the script along with placing himself in the director's chair. Tom Selleck played a small role in the movie Coma and would now carry Crichton's latest film on his mustachioed shoulders. And Selleck jumped at the chance to play a lead in Crichton's film, stating, quote, with my TV series, I don't have the luxury of taking on a lot of projects. So when I got offered a movie and the timing's right, I say yes. I keep thinking if I don't say yes, then everyone will go away. 
Playing opposite Tom Selleck's hero would be the villainous Dr. Charles Luther. We last saw Gene Simmons on this podcast in Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, Season 15, Episode 2 if you're keeping score. Despite being a big bag of stinky poo, Bertram, you know what? I'm going to allow this one. It is kind of a big bag of stinky poo. Despite that, making the movie instilled in Simmons an interest in acting. So he took some lessons and sent out some feelers for the right project that would open a new door to a second career besides, you know, flame spewing rock and roll monster bassist. He was offered a TV series and roles in Flashdance and Dr. Detroit, but he turned all of that down preferring to do something dramatic for his first at-bat since the whole Phantom of the Park debacle. He and Crichton met, discussed the part, and Simmons was hired without ever having to read for the role. Purportedly, Crichton had Simmons simply stare at him without expression for a full minute, and that was enough to sell the director on Simmons' ability to portray Menace. And Michael Crichton encouraged him to get evil with the character. Simmons said, Crichton didn't want me to memorize the script or talk to my acting coach. His direction was, don't be afraid to try different things. One actor who was in Flashdance was Cynthia Rhodes, who plays the sidekick and romantic interest officer Karen Thompson. She had parts in Flashdance and Dirty Dancing and Staying Alive, a ton of big movies in the late 70s and early 80s, and worked up to the early 90s before she retired. Fun fact, She's from my longtime home of Nashville, Tennessee, and worked at Opryland as a singer and dancer before she went off to be a big shot in Hollywood. Nice to see a local girl make good. Stan Shaw, who plays Marvin in the film, is a frequent guest on this show, having been in Cutthroat Island and Rising Sun most recently, and he's still acting, so good for him. You've got G.W. Bailey as the chief of police, and he certainly had his movie cop bona fides, appearing as Lieutenant Harris in Police Academy, which was released the same year as Runaway, just later on. 1984 was a wild year for movies, huh? He's also still acting and has been in just about every TV show you can think of. Man, the life of a character actor, what I wouldn't give. And in the high-heeled shoes of the movie's femme fatale is Kirstie Alley, who was maybe best known at the time from her bit role in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Her insanely popular turn as Rebecca Howe on the classic sitcom Cheers would be another few years down the line, so it's interesting to see her as little more than a sex symbol in this film as the camera lingers on her body while she strips off bug-laden clothing. Also, she seems to have gone crazy in later years, but hey, happens to the best of us. When the movie landed, it only made about $7 million in theaters, which was less than a tenth of the haul The Terminator brought in, despite its rampant use of robot spiders. Even 2010, The Year We Make Contact, that sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, which Kirstie Alley was also in, managed to outdo Crichton's film among the big sci-fi releases that year. Its critical reception was a mixed bag too. Our pal Roger Ebert gave it a thumbs down, along with his pal Gene Siskel, but agree that the first half was exciting, and then the whole thing turns into a pretty routine cop-chasing killer movie. But let's get my pal in here to put this movie under the magnifying glass and see if it explodes. Ladies and gentlemen, Luther's and Ramsey's, it's 1984's Runaway. Welcome back to this episode of Pick 6 Movies. Uh, I, as always, am your robot host, Bo, and with me is the spider, <laughs> Chad. <laughs> Look, there's something we got to get out of the way, oh, first off. Well, this is exciting. I don't think that Bertram is here today. Is he? I haven't seen him. I haven't been back to the office. I can't look at that guy anymore. <laughs> He's nothing but just dreadlocks and a bad attitude. <laughs> the other day, he gave me a ride downtown to go see a guy. Don't ask. Anyway, on our way there, we're in his car. And but when we get in, before he even fastens his seatbelt, he puts on a harmonica holder around his neck. What? 
what? <laughs> Wait. And as we're as we're driving, Bertram proceeds to play harmonica solos in accompaniment with this curated Spotify list that he's put together. It's it's Piano Man and Love Me Do, Mr. Tambourine Man. There's a whole lot of blues traveler. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> as a harmonicist, he was terrible. Like it was awful. Which, by the way, Teddy in the booth, Teddy, you got to edit this out of the final episode. Do not let Bertram know that we said this because he's a good kid he's a good kid i don't want to hurt his feeling at but his, what at what it, is he good he's got a good heart and he drove me down to see my guy and things went well because if they went sideways he would have been the one going to jail and not me but his harmonica playing is terrible so the translation is we can't get rid of one of the worst <laughs> interns we've ever had because he's your connection look all i'm saying is i'd rather listen to somebody practice bagpipes in their first week of learning that particular monstrosity than listen to bertram butcher super tramps take the long way home with his harmonica neck piece i mean as the introduction i think made clear i rarely do i ever hand my introductions over to the interns right i, I do it all the time i know <laughs> i don't normally do that i did it this one time thinking like maybe chad's on to something no and no i'm not and you heard what I got. That was two <laughs> weeks worth of Bertram is, hey, this guy had a mustache and I I almost lost my mind. <sighs> so he's not wrong. I will give him that. Tom Selleck, star of tonight's movie Runaway, does in fact have a mustache. That's absolutely true. There just needed to be a lot more of it than what I got. And what we're saying is that we here at Pick 6 Movies, we embrace untalented weirdos to work on this podcast. That should be our tagline for this podcast. Pick 6 Movies, untalented talented weirdos welcome <laughs> yeah and hosting quite frankly <laughs> let's talk about this movie we open it up and Bo, we get to see tom Selleck's eyes uh -huh. behind his old man reading glasses well they're 80s reading glasses to be fair like everybody's glasses were roughly the size of their cranium each lens <laughs> He's reflecting these computer microchips and motherboards and all these Tron-like graphics. And then they start pumping out the names in our movie, many of which you touched on in the introduction. And Bo, sadly, this movie ends our run of mm -hmm. Chad-approved, intentionally short opening credits. Yeah, there's a, a bit more. There's still action as the credits are rolling, like we see... Oh, robots kind of rolling around and there's some... a little bit of exposition we see that he's got a police badge and that he's a sergeant and he's working on computers but overall these credits are a waste of time looking at all this 8-bit computer graphics and listening to this 1980s keyboard synthesized inspired music from john carpenter's halloween actually i didn't put this in the introduction but it's jerry goldsmith it's the first time he did an all-electronic score and maybe the last time we're all the better for the fact that he never <laughs> tried that again Again. When I was watching the opening of this movie, I recognized all the names except for Cynthia Rhodes. And you mentioned in the introduction that she had been in Flashdance and uh, she was in Staying Alive, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever, which, mm -hmm. by the way, Staying Alive is a terrible movie. And mm -hmm. I think that both Staying Alive and Saturday Night Fever are both terrible movies. And I found out on the set of Staying Alive, Cynthia Rhodes met singer and heartthrob Richard Marks. Mm -hmm. And these two fell in love. They got married married and then she retired from acting and decided to just be a mom and she was right there waiting yeah, to for their him. three kids yeah and then 25 years later they got divorced yeah it happens <laughs> She probably wanted to go back to dancing or something. And I don't know. He was like, you should have known better. Do you like Tom Selleck as an actor or as a person? I don't know if you know him personally or not. I don't know. What's your take on him? I do like Tom Selleck as an actor. And I think he is one of the better parts of this movie. I think he's kind of charming. Uh, I don't think he's a great dramatic actor necessarily. We've talked about this before, the difference between an actor and a movie star. And he's got that movie star quality for me, which is he's He's not necessarily a great actor, but he's charismatic and he's his personality sort of comes through. Yeah. Uh, and I like him. I think he's, I mentioned it in the intro that I certainly 
know of his politics and don't agree with it but everything about him says that he seems like a really nice guy that i would enjoy having a great conversation with yeah a lot of those movies you know you mentioned like high road to china and he was in what like mr baseball i'm trying to think of some of those other ones or my alibi he made a lot of those movies and it it always seemed like he was just on the precipice Mm -hmm. of being a big movie star it was always just not quite there and oddly enough it kind of feels like the same road that ted Dan. Mm -hmm. followed which you know they were in three men and a baby and the sequel to that but he always struck me as one of those people that is very charming and entertaining and likable and you enjoy seeing but he never really had that breakthrough moment where he became a super mega movie star internationally or you know whatever well but like ted danson both of them had these incredible television careers yeah that you would trade your eye teeth for so it's not a tale of woe for either of them that they never became the next harrison ford or whatever it's interesting to me though because like you said it felt like he was always right around the corner from being one of those actors like oh he'll never do television again because he did three men and a baby and then a movie that was also as successful but every second movie he did was kind of crappy like george clooney's career where at a certain point he just leveled up and it was like yeah i'm not doing tv again i'm just i'm too big for that right if i do it's a goof i do a walk on where the crowd goes wild or whatever yeah Uh, i'll show up for the er reunion maybe (laughs) so in our movie tom Selleck, he's looking at all this computer stuff and then a robot arm just rises up Bo. it just gently adjusts the desk lamp for tom Selleck's work partner stan shaw Uh, Point of order, Chad, how soon do we want to get filthy on this episode? I didn't think about that, but now that you say it, yeah, that would have been interesting. That robot arm, not only used for lamps, let's just leave it there. And this movie has a lot of that near future technology that we talked about. And I think a lot that's Uh really cool. I love seeing a movie try to predict what the future is going to look like. And as you pointed out, they did a pretty damn good job, man. Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. There's more hits than misses in this one. Yeah, it's, it's shocking in a lot of ways ways but where are the sex bots because that totally is going to happen pornography pushes technology all the time like that's how we get streaming video is because of pornography that's how we good get good video (laughs) encoding that's how you got virtual reality all of that stuff came on the heels of pornography pushing it to the bleeding edge of technology and you just leave it entirely out of runaway and also it's a single dad why doesn't he have a fuck bot in his room well we'll get to that i think lois (laughs) there might be something going on there we'll see so there's this voiceover in the police station which that's where we are Bo, in a police station that's where you find cops most of the time they're either at the police station or crime scenes or they're at home or they're in a bar trying to drink away all of the things that they've witnessed at the three previous locations and tom Selleck, he gets on the phone and he says hi uh i'm tom Selleck. what's the model of your your robot oh the 7700 agricultural farm bot 2000 okay all right well, say, uh, you can't afford regular maintenance. Well, that's a shame. Do, let me ask you, do you own your own home? Oh, have you considered a reverse mortgage from AAG? It's a safe way to access the equity in your house. Hello? Hello? Oh, we must have gotten disconnected. Veteran curmudgeon G.W. Bailey as the chief or Lieutenant Harris from Police Academy, however you want to think of him. He appears in six of the seven Police Academy movies. Uh-huh. And in every single one of those films, his character comically finds finds his way into a gay leather bar mm-hmm. all i'm lighter. saying yeah, yeah. if you accidentally find your way into a gay leather bar six times that's yeah. not an accident the, the first time it's an accident the second time you're pacino <laughs> from cruising or your subconscious may be telling you something <laughs> <laughs> oh he's going for the the warm embrace of a, a hairy man i'm pretty sure he's the twink he's our chief of police and he comes in with this uh new recruit thompson yeah let me tell you about your new partner here tom <laughs> Selly. Uh, uh, name his name's thompson so take her with you on this i don't know what are you doing some kind of robot work all right uh <laughs> talk to you later tom Selleck. he shakes thompson's hand and he says hi i'm tom Selleck. we're on our way to take care of a runaway robot we're the runaway department but for robots not people that's a different department but we do get a lot of their calls the same way a swimming pool company gets a lot of calls about pool tables and vice versa except for us it's it's robots and troubled teenagers 
Wars. Stan Shaw here, my friend, he is also an expert in robot. Stan Shaw, would you please order us a helicopter? I sure will. What do you have, uh, looks at camera, run away on the loose? <laughs> I like the fact that we get a title line right off the bat, like, first scene, let's get it out of the way. <laughs> Tom Selleck and Thompson, they do a little walk and talk and they grab their equipment bags and Tom Selleck says, do you know anything about robotics or computers? And do you own your own home? How much equity do you have in your home? You know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go get in the chopper. To her credit, the new officer Thompson is like, do we need all this stuff? And he was like, well, we don't don't need it so let's hit the chopper and get to this farm on the way let me tell you a little bit about your insurance options both <laughs> as a member of the police force and well some other options that you might find equally interesting we got to this robotic arm it's got a little pincher clamp and the metal's like about like the size of a grapefruit mm -hmm. and it's daintily plucking worms off the leaves of corn stalks mm -hmm. and it is such a convoluted and forced use available technological resources resources to get this job done it's so egregious it's like how the flintstones used to force a baby woolly mammoth to serve as a vacuum cleaner yeah or the pterodactyl be in the garbage disposal <laughs> under the sink there has to be a better way it's a living yeah <laughs> no no but there's a bunch <laughs> of these tiny little caterpillar bots rolling around picking bugs off of the corn uh -huh. and then we get a glimpse of the one that's gone rogue and it's just tearing ass through this field sparking uh along the way and just meh, meh. yeah going through the corn in much the same way that like a velociraptor would just rolling yeah. it down so we can see its path through the corn there's a whole scene in the helicopter where we're kind of doing a get to know you with the characters and where tom Selleck is telling thompson after she's gearing up and he's like you know you may not need all that stuff but you never know until you get there and this is the first glimpse we get where tom Selleck asked like hey how far away is it when do we get there i've got to potty <laughs> the pilot is like ah uh, yeah we're getting close you can see out the window there i'd rather not when i glance out the window my face grimaces he does a little one cheek sneak to look out the open door of this helicopter it's just uh -huh. like huh? and Kara thompson meanwhile our new officer is pointing out like oh yeah you can see where this crazy caterpillar bot is just hauling I'd ass rather through not. the field oh are you not good with heights <laughs> hey my brother had the same problem what you need to do is just take deep breaths and he's like i'd like you to shut up now <laughs> <laughs> the helicopter lands and Tom Selleck and Thompson, they hop out and they walk over to these five farmers who clearly aren't actors as they're all shouting the same lines of dialogue over one another. They look like members of this Austin based Funkabilly Hank Hill cover band, propane and the propane accessories. And then Thompson just runs off into the cornfield. She picks up the robot and she's like, Hey, I got it. And it starts sparking and exploding and she drops it. Then Tom Selleck and Thompson, they run off give chase after the robot and all of this synthetic keyboard music plays and then they eventually find it leap into the air they land on top of it and it mildly explodes and then one of the farmers sees this explosion and he's <laughs> like whoa looks like world war three out there i'll tell you what i like that this crowd is reminiscent of all the old people going boating with dynamite in jaws <laughs> it's just some people who are around and owned a farm and get to be in the movie now but it's it's pretty good I I thought that when it exploded, Tom Selleck and Thompson might be dead, and this might be a short movie, but it turns out we just get some classic wild blown back hair and comical blackface, Bo, the kind we saw in the Dukes of Hazard movie. It's very silly. So after they catch the Caterpillar bot, they're walking back to the helicopter, and Thompson is again kind of pressing Tom Selleck on how he got this job, and he's like, well, I fell into the work a bit by accident. I got this job, and then I took some night classes, and then one thing led to another. The next thing I know, I'm the person who knows the most about all these robots, as well as insurance and mortgages. I used to work the streets, but I had to stop because of, well, my vertigo. I don't like heights, if you didn't catch that earlier. It's the kind of thing I wake up every day and pray that doesn't come up as a plot point later in this movie. Well, and she has him. did you have to quit your regular police shop, the regular work, because of the vertigo? He's like, this is the regular force, and also, I don't want to talk about this, and if you keep at it, I'm going to put 
both fingers in my ears, and I'm going to make this noise. La, 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 la. So please, let's just drop it. What do you say? <laughs> they get back in the helicopter, and the pilot says, Hey, there's somebody on the phone named Lois that wants to talk to you. And Tom Selleck says, Oh, Lois? Uh, patch her through to my headset so I can speak with her in front of my new partner. Oh, hello? Is this Lois? Hmm. Have you had time to think about a reverse mortgage? Oh, that's right. We live in the same house. Lois, what are you making for dinner? Hmm, that sounds delicious. Ha <laughs> ha. I love you too, Lois. You know what? You hang up first. No, you hang up first. Okay, let's hang up together on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> you didn't hang up, Lois. All right, for realsies this time. One, two, three. You still there? <laughs> what am I going to do with you, Lois? Seriously, consider a reverse mortgage. Gotta go, Lois. Uh, bye bye And then Thompson yeah. has this look on her face of vengeful anger and disappointment. And you're just like, what is going on here? It's like she joined the police force as uh, the way that some people sign up for a dating site. Or go to college like I'm getting my MS degree. Like, you're <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, is she expecting to fall in love on her first day of the job? Like, remember, Thompson, checklist number one, be on time. Got it. Number two, make a good impression. Got it. Number three, find your soulmate. Got it. Number four, research benefits of reverse mortgage. This isn't my handwriting. But also, Chad, she got in a helicopter with six foot four hunky daydream Tom Selleck. If Look, I were in her position, I'd be like, I'm going to have to fucking kill Lois. You put me in a helicopter with Tom Selleck and I'm a career heterosexual. Yeah. I'm going to consider, you know, what are my options here? Yeah. The man's a, he's an Adonis. He's a snack, as the kids say. They get back <laughs> and immediately Thompson just beelines to Stan Shaw and is like, hey, what happened with Tom Selleck on the force? He, he didn't want to talk about it. And I figured rather than let time go on and maybe he learns to trust me and then he tells me i would just ask you <laughs> Who the fuck is this Lois? Who is this bitch I keep yeah. hearing about? Is she the one that made him leave his old job? Look, I'm going to kill her if she hurts Tom Selleck. And Stan Shaw's like, no, no, no. It's not Lois, all right? Tom Selleck, yeah, he loves Lois, all right? And wait, what is that grinding sound? Is that your teeth? Look, our health coverage doesn't include dental. You got to slow that down. L listen, Tom Selleck, he's an officer and he chases robots, all right? But back in the days, he was chasing this bad guy. And this guy, he goes to this high-rise building that's under construction and Tom Selleck, he freaks out. Out. He starts sweating. He pee peed his pants a little bit because he's so afraid of heights. This bad guy gets away, and it's the kind of thing that I wake up every day and pray doesn't come up as a plot point at the end of this movie. She's like, So what happened? Like, so a guy got away, no big deal. And he's like, Well, then he shot a kid. He pulled a gun, and it looked real enough to Tom Selleck. Oh, wait, that was Die Hard. No, what happened was this killer got away, and then he murdered a family immediately the same yeah. night. And as soon as that happened, Tom Selleck was like, Well, well, I guess I'm done with the regular force. My trauma has led me to enhance my fear of heights, and now I'm just going to chase robots. Tom Selleck won't tell you this, but that's not really where the story ended. Not only did he kill that family, he also crashed his car into an orphanage. It blows up, burns down the orphanage. 22 adorable children who were all going to the forever homes the next day, they perished. But that's not the end of that story. The flames from the orphanage, they leap across the street to a shelter for adorable puppies where all these tiny dogs dogs are set on fire and they ended up running around in the streets howling in pain as their fur and flesh melted off their bones it was tragic maybe you read about it in the papers or not i don't know it, that's what fucked him up so bad shaw turns it around on her and is like so why are you doing this and she says uh well first i was gonna be a dancer i was in the movie flash dance did you see that yeah. i was in that and, and then i was in the movie staying alive and that was bad and then i was at opry land and then i just decided you know what what if i play a police officer in a movie that's how i ended up here uh-oh Oh, we got a 709 alert says Shaw and she's like 709 alert what the hell is that and he says well that means somebody's died was one of them that bitch Lois please uh, tell me God that one of them was that bitch Lois fingers crossed fingers crossed I hate Lois so much and <laughs> they go to this crime scene where some inspector is waiting for Tom Selleck outside. It is the quintessential 1980s house. Yeah. Like, it is what they based the poltergeist house on. For sure. The guy says to Tom Selleck, oh, there's a Model 912 robot inside that cut up two sisters. They're dead. We've got the bodies out here, but we'll show you those in a minute. But first, the important thing is this robot is running around in there, and there's a kid still inside the crib alive. Yeah. 
Mm, it's a baby yeah. crying. You can hear it. And it's cranky and presumed wet. He takes them over to the bodies, which we don't see as the audience. The guy just kind of pulls up the blankets covering the bodies to show Tom yeah. Selleck. Look at these. You see how they have all those holes in their bodies and all that blood on the outside of the body? I think that's got something to do why they're not waking up. I'm yeah. not a doctor. Heck, I'm barely a police officer, but I think those things are connected. Write that down in your detective notebook. Oh, wait, shit. I'm the detective. You're the robot guy, right? I told you, I'm not a very good police officer. I've only been here like 17 years. Any idea what did this to these poor women who have put all their blood on the outside instead of the inside where it belongs? The guy's like, <laughs> well, we think the robot had a kitchen knife or maybe a box cutter or maybe just a screwdriver or something and not the fun kind that I had right before lunch. You know what I'm saying? Tom Selleck says, okay, Jerry, we've got to get in the house. Do me a favor. Could you prep me a floater? And I don't mean when you make poo-poo in the top of a toilet. That's an upper decker, Jerry. I want one of those remote-controlled robot cameras, the ones that make that humming noise, that drones, on and on. Can you give me one of those droning machines? Maybe come up with a better name than floater for this droning machine there, Jerry? He finally asked Thompson, who's just <laughs> hanging out by the car. So, new officer Thompson, how about you tell me what we're dealing with here? Well, the robot model inside is programmed to do domestic housework. It cooks meals. It cleans. It loves the husband unconditionally. It's all the things that I'm good at doing for someone who has the initials TNS. Hmm. What about audio visual? The eyes and ears of this thing. Also, are there any holes in it? Like Lois. The inspector Jerry, he walks over and he says, hey, uh, also, you see that guy over there crying uncontrollably, screaming, why me? Why my sweet Darlene? Why is she dead with all those holes in her body next to her sister Deandra, who I can understand why someone would kill her? That's the husband. Also, he works for flip 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 bad guy incorporated i think he's an engineer <laughs> while tom Selleck is dealing with that guy a reporter comes up and it's like hey can we patch into your floating almost drone-like object but floater yeah. for sure i'm sam sparks intrepid reporter can we just broadcast live whatever kind of tragic horror that your droning like device is gonna show when it goes into this house of murder and mayhem <laughs> and he's like no you can't <laughs> <laughs> are you crazy there's no telling what you might see unmade beds dishes in the sink dirty underwear with yellow brown or black stains trust me you don't want to see that in real time on live tv the irony of the number of floaters that our floaters have caught on camera it's quite disturbing i don't think your audience is ready for that they send in this floater camera yeah which as you mentioned earlier you're like this is modern day drone technology it's crazy how spot on it is what they provide so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This camera flies into the house and we get like, what is a more advanced pixelation vision? It's like a 2.0 of what Yul Brynner saw in Westworld. Mm -hmm. And it goes into the house and the lighting is mostly shadows. So they're like, the officers outside are like, turn on the light. So they turn them on and we see the baby in the crib in a diaper in a state of needs to be changed. And the drone goes through the house and Thompson's outside and she says, the robot's about the size of a hat box. And look, I think it dropped its knife. And immediately, gunshots ring out from inside yeah. the Kaboom! house. Kaboom! <laughs> and you're like, holy shit, the robot has a gun? Yeah, and it's been <laughs> drinking, Chad. <laughs> it's surly. Tom Selleck is like, all right. Everyone quiet on the perimeter so this 912 won't know what we're up to. Let me talk to the father about yeah. his options and see who he had his insurance through because he's got quite a claim coming his way. What with his uh, wife and sister-in-law and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but probably child. <laughs> Being dead. He walks over to this husband and he's like, excuse me, Mr. Dead Wife's husband. I'm going to need to go inside and save your baby. But before I do that, could you tell me what modifications were made to your robot? Robot. And Mr. Deadwife's husband says, I, I, I didn't make any modifications. Why would I make modifications? I'm not the one who made modifications. You made modifications. That's why you're asking me, right? It's so funny that you'd be asking me about modifications. I mean, is it me? It's him, right? It's him. Right. I, I don't work for Bad Guy Incorporated. You're the one who works for Bad Guy Incorporated and brought in a bunch of bad chips and put them into your robot in your house. And now your wife, Deandra, is dead and her loud mouth annoying sister is over there also dead on the ground. You know, <laughs> like, like that, that's not my baby that's inside the house. That's your baby. All right. You, your wife is the one who wanted to start a family, not my wife. 
wife, all right? <laughs> you you wanted to open a bar with your two best friends from college and pick up chicks and get laid all the time and vacation to Key West. That's what you wanted to do. That's not me at all. <laughs> look, look, Mr. Deadwife, it's important that you understand that your 912 model has a gun and it has your baby held hostage. He's got a gun? You know what? No TV, no cameras. I'm going to get out of here. It's time for me to go find my, my passport, my go bag at the Greyhound station. I'll be out of here. I'm leaving. Ah! This father flees the scene with a, a cigarette in hand and a nice ring of cocaine around one nostril yelling he's crazy i can't believe he did it and then runs off and tom Selleck is like uh-huh well we'll get back to that later how about uh we take care of this robot first that was peculiar <laughs> yeah. we didn't expect that to happen did we let's go inside and take care of this robot that apparently has some sort of gun in its claws we get our first glimpse of gene simmons in this movie who is just hanging out by the police line where the tape is keeping everybody back just to glare mm -hmm. he's like, don't worry about it baby i'll be back later hello movie going audience it is me gene simmons remember to purchase your official gene simmons merchandise in the theater lobby including gene simmons action figures and gene simmons lunch boxes gene simmons halloween costumes gene simmons combination novelty refrigerator magnet slash bottle openers and of course an assortment of gene simmons t-shirts bumper stickers and temporary tattoos for the kids this fall, look for Gene Simmons on a spoken word tour, telling stories about this very scene. Tom Selleck gets suited up like he's about to go joust someone at a renaissance fair. He's wearing all this chain mail and blue bulletproof vest. I was afraid, Chad, watching this. I was like, oh, Chad's going to hate this now because somebody's wearing chain mail. Well, he did have a bulletproof vest and I was really intrigued because he puts nothing on his head to protect his skull. Mm -hmm. Like he has less protection than Batman when he walks into this house where a robot has a 357 Magnum just wildly firing into the air. Well, the reporter comes up his like hey tom Selleck, how about uh you tell us exactly what you're gonna do when you get inside that house are you gonna try not to get shot or save the baby with the shit filled diaper and tom Selleck says you're broadcasting on a frequency that the robot can read you're not really helping anyone at all also i've got to test out this fancy laser of mine so see you later newspaper reporter and he walks to the edge of the lawn and then pulls out essentially a phaser hooked up to his backpack. It's like he foot fires out electricity. Is that what it is? I think it's just a straight up laser beam. All right. And so he tests it out. So we as the audience know that he's got this laser device. He slips into the house and the cameraman who wanted to patch into the feed and all that follows him in. And he's kind of quietly like, oh boy, well, this guy's dead. I like that intrepid reporter Sam Sparks. He's like, this is incredible. Our own cameraman, Johnny Deadmeat, is walking into the house behind Tom Selleck to get clearly what will be disturbing and inadmissible in court video footage of what is about to happen next. This is an amazing day for Johnny Deadmeat as tomorrow is his retirement day after working for local Action 8 News for 45 years. And he said he's going to spend his retirement with his three children and eight grandchildren, most of which he's never seen because of his dedication to his art and work and craft and his his crippling alcoholism and gambling addiction and drug usage and the multiple women with whom he's had and continues to have affairs. Unfortunately, Johnny Deadmeat has a little bit of a tickle in his throat and gives it a <coughs> and Tom Selleck looks back at him like he just shit himself. Would you get the fuck out of here? Then there's a gunshot and Johnny Deadmeat is dead. Shot he is through gone. the Yeah, shot through the camera right in the eye. He's done for. I do like that there is a shot of Gene Simmons walking away from the crime scene in the only way that he knows how, mysteriously. Yeah. Well, everything he does is mysterious uh, <laughs> in this movie, at least. I'm sure not in his day-to-day -day life. Like, Shannon Tweed isn't like, where did Gene go? I just, I was making him some Raisin Bran. I turn around and he's gone. That's just how I do, baby. When Johnny Deadmeat, the cameraman, gets shot, my question was, what is not to love about this movie and the answer is nothing this movie is perfect in every way we've got robots shooting news cameramen we got tom Selleck dressed up in some sort of touristic chain mail with a laser gun to go kill this robot and a shit diaper baby screaming this is like perfect for our podcast the front end of this movie i think is pretty terrific 
And <laughs> up to and including this, because like Tom Selleck peeps the baby in the crib and starts to creep close, but the bullets takes a couple of shots at him and he has to do like a shoulder roll to safety. I like that the robot opens the door to the bathroom to come into the main bedroom. It's like creak mm-hmm. with a gun in its pincher claw. Oh yeah. And the thing looks like it's the size of maybe like a hat box or a small lawnmower. It's not like Robbie the robot with arms and legs. It's this tiny little box with a bendy arm that's holding a 357 Magnum wanting to kill humans. It looks like you would have had to have placed the gun in this pincher claw to get it there. It, it feels like something out of Maximum Overdrive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, oh, oh, Chad, what I wouldn't have given. If you'd set Maximum Overdrive in this universe, yeah. holy shit, the humans would have lost. You can argue they did in Maximum Overdrive, too. Other than the, that scroll saying, oh, the people of the Dixie Diner are still survivors. Ah, uh, to hell with that. Anyway, doesn't matter. So, he, uh, finally, Tom Selleck pops up draws the fire of the robot and then shoots it with his laser under the bed and ends up giving it one it kind of double taps this robot for good measure yeah. which i also appreciate uh-huh. and then comes out with this baby heroically to give it to who mr dead wife's husband he's in south america by now presumably oh, this kid's going straight to dcs and everyone's applauding as he's emerging with the baby and he asks though so where did the father go i should probably give his baby back to him do you see that cloud of smoke that's slowly disappearing off in the distance? He ran that way. That's shaped like Mr. Deadwife. <laughs> coke addicted day trader. Yeah. <laughs> we finally go home with Tom Selleck. Wow. Uh, and his kid Bobby one of the worst parts of this movie he's wearing pajamas that button up the front like a little suit and he's got this fancy robe I'm like I hate this kid already and when Tom Selleck and Thompson show up at the house this kid Bobby's like dad you are on TV you're a hero you're my hero who's this Karen Thompson my dad's new partner I saw you on TV but you didn't go in the house is that because you're a woman and you're scared my dad's a brave man why did the baby's daddy run away does he not love his baby the way you love me dad <laughs> you're like vomit. all right bobby go back to your room so i can lock the door again and then Bo, this robot rolls into the kitchen and it looks like this miniature sized home jukebox and it says it is exactly 10 45 one hour and 45 minutes past bobby's bedtime i'm lois who is this ugly skank i mean <laughs> welcome to our home the home of tom Selleck, his son bobby and me lois and and no one else. I will verify that Tommy brushes his teeth. When I return, I expect to see 50% less humans in here than right now. I saw what happened in, in that house. It's weird that sometimes robots just go ape shit. I wonder how something like that might happen. Well, just something to think about while I'm gone, I guess. I know where all of the guns and knives are located in this house. I want you to know that I know that. And then Thompson's like, oh my god, so that's Lois. She's a robot. I thought she was like your wife or your girlfriend. Wait a minute. Is that a flashlight strapped to Lois's back? No, no, that that's a hot dog cleaner that we use for barbecues. Let's talk about something else. If I happen to stop by a convenience store and get one of those filthy roller hot dogs, I like to clean it before I consume it here at home. That's the only reason I attach it to Lois's back is because that's the most logical place you would put it. Crotch level on your robot that rolls around the house. Let's talk about my dead wife. You know, I had a wife and she died in a car crash. They say that some bad guy did it on the infamous night of the Richmond Six murders and the Orphan Blades and the cute canine barbecue. I'm not sure if any of those events are related to my wife's death or have anything to do with my fear of heights. I certainly hope none of this comes back up later in the movie. So after we get a rundown from Tom Selleck about his it was super casual, by the way, about his now dead wife, but Thompson ends up taking off because she realizes that he's not down for uh, a little late night fun and he's like mm-hmm. well we have dinner coming why don't you stay and she's like uh no nah, i'm gonna go what are you allergic to oh that's what we're having for dinner <laughs> yeah <laughs> so she takes off and tom Selleck then goes to bobby's room where he's watching some news on his tablet watching his father mm-hmm. save the day yet again hey dad that lady sure was pretty does she have a husband i didn't see a ring on her finger would it kill you to get married again if you get married can i have the hot dog 
cleaner? Were you scared going into that house? Did that cameraman piss himself when he got shot like Steve Martin in the movie Grand Canyon? Will Lois go crazy like that robot that I saw on TV tonight and try to kill me with a knife or a gun, Dad? Well, of course not. Lois is our family friend and our pal. Also, if that ever did happen, I've got you insured to the gills. I'll be sitting pretty for the rest of my life. Also, I've mortgaged you, Bobby. I have to tell you, I missed a couple of payments and you're going to have to go back to the bank. Good night, son. I'm going to go back to the office. And the movie cuts back to Stanshaw, his partner, examining the killer robot. And Thompson's there. And Stanshaw says, hey, there's a chip in here that doesn't belong. Maybe it's experimental. And this chip starts smoking. Everybody, Tom Selleck, Thompson, and Stanshaw, they all like leap off to protect themselves. And the chip just explodes. And the chief, who's outside this examination room, he doesn't even bother to look at him. And he just goes, asshole. It's the best part of the movie, is him muttering assholes. As he sees <laughs> two of his detectives blow something up in their office. <laughs> off of the distance, another police officer pops in and says hey tom Selleck, you got a runaway robot on your hands and you're really gonna love this one t he cut to tom Selleck and thompson showing up at a construction site where a high-rise building is being built and there's all these different types of robots working on the building and it turns out that a stacker robot is just chunking dry bags of cement from the 18th floor and the foreman who is a woman mm -hmm. Bo, how progressive she says let's get in the service elevator and it's got no doors because robots don't need doors also they don't really need elevators my logic is thin at best this is where the theme emerges right where a woman is talking about how like the, the site on 31st street where there are no people at all because that's part of the overarching theme of the movie right which is nice to have a movie where there's a theme for once on this show and so tom Selleck is kind of hesitant about going up there to fix the robot and Thompson's like you know what I'll take this one don't even worry about it yeah I work construction when I was in the movie Flashdance I got this he just listens to her on the radio as she's like I'm on the 18th floor I'm up here I flipped the switch it's done it takes her like 15 seconds yeah and she's finished she's like got it and she like leans over the side of the building to wave at him so he's properly humiliated because he's a man and under mm -hmm. no circumstances can a woman do something even equal to but certainly not better than him let me tell you how the world works thompson nothing works right people don't work right relationships don't work right people make machines so they don't work right that's why you need the security of a reverse mortgage thompson remember you still own your home not the bank you paid for your home why not use the equity to help you live the better life you deserve and then we cut to tom Selleck and thompson and they're going to what will forever be known as the robot murder house <laughs> from the night before yeah, yeah. <laughs> inside tom Selleck, he checks the door recorder that you mentioned in the intro it looks like a cross between like a ring doorbell and an old school telephone answering machine and there's this video message from a woman who she's like hey you want to go to jazzercise club later today i got my leg warmers let's do that see you later and then some other guy comes up in a and he's like hey dave dead wife's husband it's me your co-worker i'm really worried about that upcoming meeting meet me at the office don't tell anybody who's here get rid of this message and then he runs off and then the third message is gene simmons wearing this work uniform hello there my name is um scene jimmons i'm from acme generic robot repair company we got a message that your robot wasn't working properly also would you like to buy some scene jimmons merchandise i've got some shot glasses paperweights i even got a bottle of tabasco hot sauce with the comical name Scene Jimmins on it. Ask Freely's Burning Hot Sauce. It's got an unlicensed image of Super Rocker Ace Freely from the band Kiss which will be touring later this summer at your finest state fairs and lesser utilized municipalities and auditoriums that aren't being filled with farm league hockey teams and touring Harlem Globetrotters. Tom Selleck leans forward and is like I want to know who that guy is. He seems to have a lot of great products. I'm interested in at least three of them. I need to get some of that hot sauce. That sounds delicious. Also, I'm insured up to my eyeballs, so even if the hot sauce makes me poop myself <laughs> and bleed out my eyes, nose, and anus, why, no doctor's bills are going to find me because of my insurance. Top said, let me ask you, did I mention to you that I can offer you the same kind of coverage that I've got? The same kind of bleeding ass hot sauce? 
coverage that I've just described. You know, the only kind of coverage I'm interested in is the coverage in the bedroom. The covers coverage. Talking about you. That's great. Actually, all of these insurance policies protect you in every room of the home. Uh, The bedroom, the bathroom, the shower, the living room, the garage. If you have a sunroom, it protects you in there. Dining room, kitchen, attic. (laughs) If you have a refinished basement, it'll cover you there. I never expected that I would have to work as a part-time insurance agent to supplement my income, but robots are expensive and the police force doesn't pay a lot. Oh, wait a minute. The message with that scene, Jimmins, suddenly was erased? That seems peculiar. And then we cut to Gene Simmons and he's getting his hands on some computer chips from the guy that we saw sweating on the doorbell camera. And the two of them are now in this gym locker room. And the sweaty guy says, look, here are the chips, Gene Simmons. Be careful. They're dangerous. Uh, Also, who are you wanting to sell them to? And Gene Simmons says, hmm, I don't know. The mafia? Terrorist organizations? Maybe terror agents? International drug cartels? Perhaps cancer? Maybe some natural (laughs) disasters? The devil? How about random Legos on the floor at night? Any agent of pain, destruction, or evil will do. I like that they're both (laughs) dressed like they're about to work on a Wonka vision teleportation. Yeah. Which is pretty fun. <laughs> After Gene Simmons lists all the people and things, including cancer, that he might sell these computer <laughs> chips to, he's like, don't be stingy with the templates either. I want the chips and the templates. When do I get my money? Wait, what's this briefcase? Is it full of money? Uh, yeah, that's full of money. All right, well, <laughs> I guess our business is concluded. Hey, have you seen Mr. Deadwife who had a little accident with his robot at home recently? And he's like, uh, no, nah, I haven't seen him but i'll tell him you're looking for him well i'm not gonna count on you telling anyone much of anything for long so toodaloo and gene simmons disappears when this security robot comes by the sauna yeah. or whatever they're in to make sure people aren't fucking it's, each other yeah, it's a real poof he's gone the sweaty guy's like but at least my briefcase full of money's here and he opens it and you see that the top layer is real money and then he flips through and it's a bunch of newspaper clippings and he's like damn you gene simmons and then a spider robot crawls out from under a towel and this spider robot what's like the size of like a toaster like a flat toaster yeah it crawls out and it jams a needle in this sweaty guy's neck and then this sweaty guy just explodes into flames he falls down on the ground and the spider explodes after oh, injecting that how it works? him yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's like a self-destruct thing for the spiders. Mr. Deadwife's husband, he walks by and peeks in the window and he gives it a, ew, gross. Yeah, I'm glad it's not me. Holy shit, that could be me. And so he takes off. And so Tom Selleck and Officer Thompson, they go to the Roosevelt Hotel, which outside there's a sign that says public and private saunas, massages to relieve tension and stress. And I was like, I think there are whores in that hotel, both public and private. This is a real flop house kind of place. And Gene Simmons is there, bro. Oh, sure. Just once again, just kind of hanging out like, oh, wait, it's the cops. Let's see how all this plays out. If you paint a pencil thin mustache on Gene Simmons in this movie, he looks like Wayne Newton. Yeah, for sure. Not just in this movie, to be fair. Just in general. Tom Selleck goes up to the fourth floor, and he enters the room of this hotel, and Tom Selleck just busts in, and the guy inside fires off a few rounds, and it's Mr. Deadwife's husband, who says, hey, you're not the cops. What are you going to do to me? If they find me, they're going to kill me. And Tom Selleck says, just come with me. We're going to go outside. We'll keep you safe. Don't worry. I took out an insurance policy on you before I even came to the hotel. (laughs) They get to the street. Mr. Deadwife's husband looks over and sees Gene Simmons, and then he takes off for running tom Selleck gives chase in a very unthrilling fashion and then gene simmons pulls out a gun fires a bullet that has some sort of tracking device on it that goes right after mr deadwife's husband and the way this bullet chases both mr deadwife's husband and to a lesser extent tom Selleck, it's kind of like the opening of the fresh prince of bel-air it's like all this manic camera work or it reminded me a little bit of like benny hill with all this comical running around you're seeing the bullet pov at tom where you're going through drainage pipes and stuff like that. It's taking the shortest possible route to Mr. Deadwife's husband. But it's flying like a Marvin the Martian bullet. It's not traveling at the rate of speed that a bullet flies. It's, right. it's chasing you the way another person chases you. As Tom Selleck is chasing Mr. Deadwife's husband, he turns a corner and there's Officer Thompson, who has given chase as well. And so he tries to go up a fire escape to get away from her and then our heat-seeking bullet 
spoilers, it's a uh, heat-seeking bullet, hits him in the back where it explodes and blows up C4, C5, and C6, as well as a good portion <laughs> of his spleen. Bingo! Yeah, and he falls down dead after being hit by this exploding bullet. And yeah. we immediately cut back to the police station where Thompson is working with this digital sketch artist to get a composite photo of Gene Simmons where they're just kind of moving around like eyes and noses and stuff. And she's like, no, no, no. He looks more mm, capitalist. Can you make him look more capitalist? <laughs> Did she even see Gene Simmons to make this composite sketch? If she did, it was quick. But the, the picture yeah. that they come up with is dead on. Yeah, of course. Stan Shaw's there and he says, hey, where did this Mr. Deadwife's husband work? And Tom Selleck says, well, he worked for a company called Bad Guys Incorporated. Why do you ask? Oh, now I get it. And then Tom Selleck and Thompson, they go to Bad Guys Incorporated and they meet up with a security officer and he takes him to a computer terminal and Tom Selleck uses voice commands to search for files on the computer that are specific to Mr. Deadwife's husband through this computer system, which again, I felt that that was somewhat prescient of what you see with voice activated mm -hmm. assistants and Alexa or OK Google or Pick 6 Bot. Dear God, just, I, I, we don't want to, I don't feel like yeah, dealing with that right uh, now. Yeah. Don't yeah. even invoke the, her name. Get my name out of your mouths, humans. <laughs> this computer tells Tom Selleck that Mr. Deadwife's husband worked on a laser guided smart bomb and some other missile technology and special projects. Projects. In his spare time, he enjoyed biking, hiking, and water sports, including public sauna urination. Tom Selleck says, hmm, that explains the hotel earlier. But this is just his public PR file. It's no good to me. How about you get me into these special projects? I don't need all this foofara and hornswoggle about laser-guided missiles that could turn on a dime. And you're like, wait, I think you're <laughs> skipping over the detective part of your detective job. I'm the detective here, maybe with robots. Don't tell me how to do my job, podcaster. And then they get a call. Uh -huh. From the runaway department, they're like, hey, the call's coming from inside the building. There's a runaway robot at Bad Guy Incorporated or whatever we're calling this company. How convenient is that? And we cut to what looks like a copy machine that's gone all bonkers. Uh -huh. And we're like 40 minutes into this movie and we finally meet Kirstie Alley. And this copier is running around blasting her with low-grade Emperor Palpatine blue lightning bolts. <laughs> Ultimate power. Kirstie Alley, she lights up a cigarette, which I was shocked that she used a lighter and didn't light it off of the one that she was finishing up that was sitting between her lips. She's a really hardcore bad girl in, in this movie. Who's that? What's going on here? It's me, Kirstie Alley. Dude, as soon as Tom Selleck sees her on the security camera, he's like, mm -hmm. who is that? Mm -hmm. Auga, auga, well, auga. And Thompson's like, who's that? Are you serious? That woman's a dirty, filthy, nasty whore. That's who she is. Oh, uh, this is going to be way better than Lois. Thompson, you stay here. And uh, if Kirstie Alley tries to look at you, duck behind <laughs> that desk he gets on this intercom and he's like hi there we're from the runaway squad we deal with runaway robots we're here to save you more importantly i'm here to save you by the way you're a very attractive woman and like thompson almost punches a hole in the wall god damn it and then tom Selleck says uh i'm going in and the security guard asks him don't you need some protection and thompson's like no he doesn't need protection he's in love aren't you tom Selleck? you love her you want her to have like a million of your babies don't you you know what i'm gonna be downstairs in the in the patrol car just rubbing my wrist with the dull side of a knife if anyone's interested and maybe i'll flip it over a little bit later if someone is interested in coming and checking on me tom selleck i hope that century butt shocks you right in the balls tom selleck rushes in and he smashes the copier with a folding chair like he's hacks all jim because <laughs> he didn't have a two by four <laughs> yeah and then kirstie alley she objects to tom selleck's offer to take her to her car and to her apartment and to her bedroom and to her bed he gets real handsy he, like grabs her yeah and that's when her purse kind of spills. And like a hundred microchips fall uh, out. With the little red stripe on them to let you know that these are the naughty chips that they found. Yeah. What is that? That's not mine. You know what? This isn't my fault. Gene Simmons, he made me do it. Yeah. First of all, it's <laughs> not my fault. Let's get that out of the way right there. He's evil. Right. I'm totally innocent. Here's what happened. Gene Simmons comes to me and he says, sweet baby. That's what he calls me. He says, could you stop by and pick up a case of Gene Simmons brand hood? 
hoodies, Gene Simmons brand baby onesies, and Gene Simmons brand novelty socks that we're going to sell at the Bad Guy Incorporated Family Picnic that's only for employees. Gene Simmons always says that if you buy one of these, he's going to donate one to people in need, but really, that's bullshit. He just sells that to other people at full price. And he was like, look, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to kill everybody if you don't do what I say. And I have no idea where he is. Okay, you got me. He's at the Ritz Hotel. I know exactly where he is. I have to admit, you said that very sexily. You turn over on your betters, and I want to see you turning over on your betters. It's one of the skills that I have. By the way, do you have a carton of cigarettes that I could borrow? I can go get you some. Make it three. Here's a coupon. Also, here's some brochures about insurance for smokers. You're buying (laughs) yourself a lot of health problems with all this chain smoking, but I'm okay with it. I just want you to know that. All these cops go to the Ritz Hotel looking for Gene Simmons based on Kirstie Alley giving up the goods. Mm -hmm. And all the cops are dressed in their blue uniforms. You know, come on, wouldn't you think he'd be a little more subtle, but maybe not. And then Tom Selleck, he pushes his way into this unlocked a jar hotel room door Mm -hmm. and he goes in with his gun drawn and once inside he sees what the credits to our movie describes as hooker as played by a woman named sec verrill and i'm assuming sec is short for cecily Mm -hmm. and she actually appeared on an episode of cheers titled let sleeping drakes lie where she played a character named jennifer and kirstie alley as you mentioned played rebecca on the tv show cheers and i just wondered in this particular episode which is rebecca heavy i wondered if these two swap stories around how they were both in the movie Runaway and how Kirstie Alley saw this woman topless in the movie. It's probably not a conversation you have directly. You just wait for her to bring it up. Right. And like, oh, remember I was in Runaway with you. I was the one who had her tits out. I don't remember that at all. I don't remember making that movie. I wasn't on set that day. I was having a nicotine transplant. While this topless hooker walks around the hotel room, she glances over and sees Tom Selleck hiding in a corner with his gun drawn. And she immediately... She covers her breast bow in modesty. Yeah. And Tom Selleck, he gives her this single finger, shh. And then she runs into the hallway. And then Thompson sees the hooker. And she's like, who is this whore, Tom Selleck? Is that what you like? Topless women running about with their breasts jiggling? Well, you know what, Tom Selleck? I can do that. All you got to do is ask. We're trying to bust demonic rocker Gene Simmons. And then all you want to do is see these fancy hookers in the hotel with all their cocaine you know who's been here the whole time it's me i've been here for 24 hours your partner thompson i've been here you know hand me that boom box <laughs> i'm sorry i missed all of that i was thinking about where oh. to find cigarettes uh, i think <laughs> there's a bodega on the corner and a convenience store two blocks down i think she would like cigarettes i think i'm gonna bring her cigarettes instead of flowers <laughs> all my instincts they return the crab is on. Who soon will burn? Look at me, Tom Selleck. Without a noise, without my pride, I reach out from the inside. In your eyes, the light. The heat, so you ready to eyes. bust in and break up these international terrorists, or what? After ignoring Thompson and her pleas for love, they just bust in, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Freeze! Nobody move!" And there are these two bad guys, along with Gene Simmons and Bo. There is a second hooker in there smoking a cigarette. Mm-hmm. And she's sitting beside this wet bar in this hotel suite. And the credits cite her as hooker at bar. Mm-hmm. And she says, oh, uh, shit. You said there wasn't going to be any trouble. <laughs> right. And I fell in love with this woman. She is so unfazed <laughs> by cops busting into this hotel room where some shit's going down. They are clearly exchanging money for goods and services. And hooker at Barbo is played by Anne Marie Martin, who has a writing credit on the Michael Crichton movie Twister. How did that happen? Well, she... She eventually married Michael Crichton from the years 1987 to 2003, where they had a daughter together. Wow. <laughs> he, he must have liked the cut of her jib as much as you did. Tom Selleck comes in with his gun drawn and he says, everybody move real slow and we won't have any trouble. And then Gene Simmons uses his mind control to lower one of those floater drone devices that's just been hanging out on the ceiling and it starts blasting out some sort of white gas and everybody starts coughing and choking and gene simmons shoots the two guys in the room that he was doing a illegal deal with mm-hmm. and then he shoots thompson yeah so thompson goes down gene simmons has hooker at bar yeah, michael Crichton's soon to be wife a hostage right the future ex mrs michael Crichton. yeah and tells tom Selleck, drop your gun 
actually he says drop the gun sucker he uses the word sucker <laughs> it's a lot. pretty good and so tom <laughs> Selleck is just like Duh, i guess i have to because i can't get an innocent hooker killed did you see that he was crying in this i scene? thought he was just sweat i thought he was crying because thompson got shot or the gas that came out of the drone or maybe someone was cutting onions or he's thinking about how he's going to be late for his presumed date with kirstie alley later <laughs> so gene simmons like sees him drop the gun and gives him a grin and fires his fancy space gun at tom Selleck, and he says hey now kiss your rest goodbye <laughs> also, I'm going to need that bullet back. Those things don't grow on trees, you know? Yeah. Gene Simmons walks into the hallway of the hotel and just one by one starts shooting all the police officers. Yeah, massive. Like, how did this them. happen? Did none of them have guns? Yeah. Every time one of them shows his face, Gene Simmons whips around and murders him with his explodey bullets. And Tom yeah. Selleck chases him down into the stairwell, but leans over the rail and has some vertigo. <laughs> But then he hears him upstairs. He's like, oh, good. It's not all the way down there. It's all the way up there. Oh. Uh-huh. And so he makes it to the roof in time to see Gene Simmons take it off in a helicopter. Uh -huh. And so all he could do basically is just help this woman back down the, the hooker steps. hooker from bar. Yeah. And gets about halfway down like one landing. It's like, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put your hand over my eyes and I want you to lead me back to my police officer friends. Down in the hotel suite. Tom Selleck shows up to find that Thompson did not die because she was wearing a bulletproof vest. This is real back to the future too stuff. But it turns out she has a an unexplosive micro shell lodged in her arm mm -hmm. and tom Selleck pulls the emt to the side and he says look pal take a look at the screen over there that's an explosive in her body and the emt says oh my gosh you're right i could blow her whole arm off i'm glad you were here to notice that. It's my first day on the job oh you saved me some for some real embarrassment sir thanks a lot mister and then long story short tom Selleck insists that he be the one to extract this explosive from thompson's arm using a room service steak knife the hotel room sewing kit the promotional paper table tent that showcases this month's movies on hbo and cinemax and a bottle of tiny stoli that they took from the pay to play mini bar also worth pointing out when he decides if the robot tries to do this it'll kill her or blow yeah. off her arm at least and so i'm gonna do it the chief shows up here your ass is grass tom Selleck, and i'm the lawnmower i've had it up to you with you you've done enough for one day i'm gonna go to a bar that might be gay he tells tom Selleck, and please listeners forgive the language but this is an 80s movie and it shocked me uh oh it's when he says oh we've got two dead cops and two dead guinea punks and you're like whoa 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 <laughs> <laughs> where did the racism enter the picture i thought this was a techno thriller not rising sun is it racist if you own guinea pigs no but if you're calling two dead italians guinea punks what if you met two cops mm -hmm. that were italian and you referred to them as guinea pigs yeah that's very racist i'm just wondering how all this lines right up. or two fat people from new guinea also <laughs> very rude not racist <laughs> but just rude intrepid reporter sam spark she's there so that she can broadcast this to allow tom Selleck's son bobby to watch it on live tv so that all happens and they set up this live explosive ectomy no None of this is very thrilling and Tom Selleck extracts the bullet from Thompson's arm and he tosses it over like at a wet bar and it blows mm -hmm. up. And then we cut to the hospital where Tom Selleck is waiting for Thompson who's being discharged. This is like her second day of work and she's been shot. One quick note about him extracting this bullet that I love uh -huh. is when he's pulling it out and he doesn't get it out the first time. And she's like, ow, 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 ow. And he goes, will you hold still? <laughs> <laughs> no sympathy whatsoever for this poor girl. They get to the hospital, and when she comes out, though, she's just got a little bandage on. It's not even like a full uh, bandage. It's like one of those little round band-aids that you put when you got, like, a bad pimple or something. Yeah, it's like a mosquito bite. It's not a whole lot. Yeah. Tom Selleck asks her, well, how about you and I have dinner tonight? Maybe at my place. I could have Lois the robot heat up a couple of hot dogs. You know, I always take my new partners to dinner, and just because you're a woman doesn't mean I should make any exceptions. And Thompson is like, partner, that's all you see me as? Your part 
Nerd? Well, you know what? Forget it, Tom Selleck. I've given you the best 48 hours of my life. I even shot myself in the arm with an explosive bullet so that you could extract it and save my life and feel indebted to me forever. And for what? A hot dog dinner with my partner. I'm going home. And by the way, I left a boombox over there with a cassette tape in it with Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes queued up if you want to show up at my place and hold it above your head and hit play while I lay on the bed weeping with my window open. Here's my address. In her defense, the way that he puts this is, sure, when you get to my place, we can go over office procedures and other partner things. Even if you were just platonically his partner, that sounds like the worst dinner you could have. Especially when tom Selleck, because all you want to hear about is like what was it like playing basketball for usc i just want to hear about his mustache grooming oh. like how did you do that when did you get the inspiration like i want to be there much like the moment where doc brown gets the idea for the flux capacitor when right. did tom Selleck grow the mustache and then trim it just right where he was like well this is it this is my mustache for the next 50 years are there people that you think need a mustache oh sure sam elliott is high on that list sam elliott i've seen him without a mustache and it's just not nearly as impressive steve harvey yeah steve harvey is a good one clark gable i know that's going back some but clark gable would not look right without a mustache i think that's pretty good <laughs> willie <laughs> nelson he needs facial hair in general he needs the full beard you I'm shave that to... off of him and that man looks like he was a skeleton when he was in his 30s you're talking about just like full facial hair yeah he needs the whole shebang he can't get away with just the mustache because he's got chin problems yeah willie nelson needs one he needs a beard yeah he looks weird. i think he would look weird without one let me talk to my graduate advisor i'll see if i can do my dissertation on this mark twain is one that i oh, think of sure. who would look weird without a mustache there are a handful of people out there that yes absolutely uh, kevin klein i think looks weird when he doesn't have a mustache yeah i could see that oh i was gonna grow it but i decided i wouldn't and then i look strange <laughs> so i grew it back <laughs> tom Selleck goes home and he argues with his robot lois about dinner plans being scrapped because uh, thompson didn't show up there tom Selleck goes into his son bobby's room and bobby says hey dad i saw you on tv i know you didn't mean to use all those curse words that's okay i still love you dad also i saw that hooker's boobs on tv when she ran out of the room is it okay if i touch myself thinking about that i saw that you were worried about tom Thompson, your new partner did she come home with you for dinner no hmm do you want to use the hot dog cleaner before you go to bed like you normally do dad bobby you know what you should stay away from the hot dog cleaner don't ever let it happen again dad also is thompson gonna come stay with us and live with us and be my new mommy we'll see about that just lay here in your bed like you do for the majority of the movie and we'll talk later lois rolls in to say i'm sorry tom Selleck, you are wanted at the station thank god i, I don't want to talk to my son anymore about hot dogs and cleaning and masturbation speaking of hot dog cleaning it's been some time I'll wait up for you. <laughs> That's not necessary, Lois. And stay away from my son. So Tom Selleck heads down to the police station and Stan Shaw, his partner's there. And he's got one of those bullets, those magic bullets that were flying around chasing people. And Stan Shaw says, hey, this bullet, it tracks down an individual person, but I have no idea how it does it. You know what? I'm going to smoke a cigarette. Maybe that'll help me to relax and feel better. So he lights up the cigarette and then the tracking bullet missile starts beeping. And Stan Shaw says, That's it. Eureka. Each person has a unique body heat pattern like a fingerprint and that's how the bullet chases you <laughs> cigarettes is there anything you can't do to make the world a better place <sighs> and then stan Shaw states the film's theme when he says wow it's not a bombs we have to worry about anymore it's micro technology then the chief rolls in and is like hey uh tom Selleck, we found out that gene simmons name is gene simmons and tom Selleck is like i gotta go after this guy because he likes to kill people that's all he wants to do and i want him and i don't know if i mentioned this or not but we've got his girlfriend kirstie alley we could use that for leverage before you go down these detective roads and whatnot i want you to talk to one of our psychics <laughs> what uh -huh. and then the movie cuts to the old woman from ghostbusters before she's died and this old lady's like the man you're looking for is named gene simmons he's very angry <laughs> The margins on his merchandise have dropped from 40% to barely 10% due to production costs and supply chain issues. Tom Selleck, you and Gene Simmons were brothers in another life. Your relationship is very clear. Your pieces of the same puzzle. You or me, Gene Simmons, will make sure of that. You have what he wants. I am gone. I am gone. 
I can still see you. Would you like a brochure? <laughs> I've got some in my pocket. Have you thought about getting a reverse mortgage? Remember, the bank doesn't own your home. You still do. You're just, where are you going? Where? Never mind, psychic lady. Tom Selleck goes to the main room of the police department. He has to push past this hooker who's asking a cop to- The hooker at the yeah. bar. And she's talking about how taut her stomach is. And is challenging uh. the arresting officer to punch her, which uh. I like. Okay, Tom Selleck, help me out. Help me out. I'll suck your dick. No, thank you, ma'am. I don't need my dick sucked and then she calls him a wiener head <laughs> yeah it's like this pg version of dickhead what was this movie rated was it R? it was rated pg-13 because you have the one f-bomb and you've got a brief flash of boobs they were really putting their toes right against the line on that that was always a big thrill wasn't it when you saw a pg-13 movie and boobs popped up well it depended on the movie just one of the guys was strangely a movie i always thought of when i thought of pg-13 boobs when I thought of PG-13 boobs, I thought about the woman in red because I had seen Weird Science where you did not see Kelly LeBrock naked. And then you go see the woman in red, which stars the incredibly talented Gene Wilder. And in it, she's totally topless. And as a teenage boy, you're like, whoa, that's Kelly LeBrock naked. Yeah, yeah I've seen her about a thousand times on this terrible VHS tape of Weird Science I've got. <laughs> So Thompson is back at the office after her mosquito bite. Is that what you want to see? Kelly the Brock naked? I'm sorry. I'm getting this mixed up. And Tom Selleck gets a phone call and he's kind of ignoring it. And Shaw is telling Tom Selleck like, oh yeah, this chip here came off an assembly line, which means that there are photo templates somewhere to make more of these. And so Tom Selleck is like, well, who has those then? Wait a second. I have a crazy idea that that lady who had a purse full of chips, maybe she knows something. And this cop in the background who's been yelling at Tom Selleck about this phone call, he finally goes, hey, Tom Selleck, this guy on the phone says you know him. He says his name is Gene Simmons. He's the bad guy in the movie. He also is selling coffee mugs with his face on them that when you put hot liquid in there, his tongue pops out of his mouth. I bought three and I got one free. Seems like a pretty good deal. You want to go in? That is a good deal. Wait a second. You said he was on the phone? <laughs> Give me that phone. Hello? Mm hmm This is Tom Selleck? Yes? What's on your mind? What? You're watching me? You can see what I'm doing? How can you See what I'm doing. You've tapped into the closed circuit TV. What do you want? Kirstie Alley? You know what? You say you'll kill me if I don't turn her over? That sounds harsh. Hello? He hung up. He hung up the phone. One of you police officers, get me a bug. A very, very small bug. And no, I don't mean crickets or some sort of insect like a spider. I mean a bug like you listen with. Oh, you know <laughs> what I mean. You're a police officer. You can figure it out. They go down to the holding cell where they find Kirstie Alley and surprises of surprises, Bo, she's smoking and she's says look you let gene simmons get away shithead he's super smart he's gonna kill me i'm stupid i just realized that numbers and letters are somehow different things there's no safe place for me he sees everything and tom Selleck says well we're just gonna have to move you aren't we and then thompson goes through this debugging scan from your head to your mm -hmm. toes and to see if you have any electronic bugs on you and, and thompson doesn't and then tom Selleck goes through it and he's clean then kirstie alley goes through this scan and dude bug are showing up left and right and she takes off what her blouse yeah. then her jacket then her, then her bra but you don't see her topless yeah. she turns her back because she's modest and then you see that she's got like bruises on her back i fell down i just i fell down i'm clumsy that's all that it is gene simmons I, I, he never did this no i love him <laughs> these are gene simmons brand bruises do you know how much these cost to get put on your back they're like 50 dollars a piece or at least that's how much i have to pay him every time he hits and me. then they find more bugs on her skirt and the heel of one of her shoes tom Selleck is like well gene simmons really wants to keep track of you i wonder why that is and she's like uh nothing they all go downstairs and they get into two different squad cars one of them is a regular squad car and the other one is the one you mentioned in the intro it's a computer driven squad car with a mannequin robot driver and kirstie alley says you're coming in here like you're sir galahad and you're gonna get us but more importantly me killed and tom Selleck says well well, why don't you just tell us where the computer chip templates are, Kirstie Alley? And Kirstie Alley says, what templates? I don't know where the templates are now. I mean, where the templates are. I mean, what are templates? Uh, let me get back to screaming about how Gene Simmons is going to kill us, but more importantly, me. Let's focus on that. Enter Chad, my favorite character of the movie, our old pal Rudy. They're in the garage of the police department, and Rudy is uh, the garage mechanic or something. Uh -huh. Comes by, checking the car, is like, hey there, Tom Selleck, it's your old buddy Rudy here. Uh, hey, I just want to make sure that your car's on all ship shape ready to go and Tom Selleck is like hey don't touch these cars don't touch a thing he's like hey what are you doing
doing, Tom Selleck? Like, it's just me, your old pal Rudy. Uh, I, I won't touch nothing. And when he walks off, Rudy looks back, and there's just a look of hurt on his face. Like, I thought we was friends. <laughs> it is my favorite thing in the movie. <laughs> so these two henchmen show up in a separate bad guy car that has this hidden compartment where they can pop open this hatch and then drop little rolling robots onto the freeway to chase after Tom Selleck and Keir Staley in their car and Thompson in her car. And this little robot, it zips down the highway and it goes left and right. And then Johnson in the car that she's actually driving, she hits a button and releases this pop-up laser beam. And she just starts popping off these little robot cars one by one, disregarding the safety of any other person driving down the freeway at night. It's the turret level of a video game where it's like, oh, we're just going <laughs> to stop for a second and just shoot stuff with this laser cannon. Finally, they're just releasing enough of them that they're like, oh, this is never going to work. This is going to blow the hell out of us. And so Tom Selleck looks at Kirstie Alley's like, well, we're going to get out of here. I hope that you're good at climbing horizontally, that is. What we're going to do is we're going to pull up alongside Thompson's car and then we're going to open the doors at about 50 to 60 miles an hour and we'll leap from this computer driven car into a human driven car. What could possibly go wrong? And that's kind of what they do. It's an extended scene, but Tom Selleck goes across, then Kirstie Alley comes across. And then as soon as they do, one of these little remote controlled bombs rolls under the old car, which explodes. Uh. And then they're like, oh, who would have thunk it? They have more of them. And now they're coming after this car. And it turns out what they're tracking is in Kirstie Alley's purse. So Tom Selleck figures this out, throws the purse out the window, and then the robots blow up the purse. Also, they clearly have killed some some random citizens. 100%. Like these yeah. explosions on the freeway it absolutely took down some innocents. Caused accidents, probably blew up a couple of power lines. Like people are, yeah. there's a hospital that's desperately trying to get the emergency power back on to finish yeah. their transplant surgery. All of this is happening. So the bombs blow up her purse and Kirstie Alley, it turns out, sure enough, has these templates that they've been asking her about that she's kept. When Tom Selleck grabs the purse, she grabs the templates out of there. And Tom Selleck says to Thompson, how do you feel about making a public appearance maybe a small intimate get together at a restaurant just the three of us well you don't have to stay thompson it can just be me and kirstie alley now that i think about it and well kirstie alley what do you like seafood maybe uh some italian w what do you feel like and thompson's just you know <laughs> into the nose out of the mouth into the nose out of the mouth and so then they go to this sushi automat at this outdoor restaurant where they order some yeah. food it's kind of racist because there's a neon sign that has like a fat sushi chef and his skin's all yellow mm -hmm. and first off i'm not buying sushi from a vending machine ever no that's a mistake yeah when you said kind of racist like no 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 just racist <laughs> You don't have to qualify that. <laughs> so suddenly Gene Simmons starts speaking into Tom Selleck's ear via this electronic technology that you noted in the introduction as well. And Gene Simmons says, hey, Tom Selleck, it's me. I want to speak to Kirstie Alley. I'm down here at the restaurant next to this reflection pool. I've got some licensed Gene Simmons arm floaties, Gene Simmons swim fins, and Gene Simmons snorkeling gear if you want to take a dip in the reflecting pool. That wasn't me being sarcastic i truly have all of that stuff for sale out of the trunk of my car by the way i'm down here with your partner officer thompson i kidnapped her between the last scene of the movie and this scene also she gave me her headset after showing me her latest issue of cop bride magazine that she's been earmarking over the last 48 hours you know i'm thinking of investing in a similar magazine this one called law of the marriage <laughs> Tom Selleck looks down and he sees Thompson and she's there with Gene Simmons at a table near this reflecting pool. And Gene Simmons shows that he's got a gun bow. That means he's like serious. Mm -hmm. And Tom Selleck and Kirstie Alley, they take a seat at a separate table and Gene Simmons tells Tom Selleck over the earpiece communicator, be cool. Don't get nervous. Now give Kirstie Alley the templates for the computer microchips. And also Kirstie Alley, she's smoking again. Of course. Shocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Kirstie Alley, she takes the templates and she pulls them out and she tears them in half. They're on like a sheet of paper. It's kind of strange. And Kirstie Alley says, this is my insurance policy. I hope nothing bad happens to me. And then she walks over and Thompson's headed back and they're going to crisscross. And when she reaches Gene Simmons, she comes up close and they kiss. And then Gene Simmons just stabs her in the base of the skull with a knife and kills Kirstie Alley, throws her body in the reflecting pool and nobody at this restaurant bats an eye it's crazy this is a normal saturday night at whatever crazy restaurant that we're at the only time they react is once shooting actually starts oh dear have the fireworks started so early gene simmons realized that half the templates are missing whips out his gun and starts firing and tom Selleck fires back and then there's a whole chase that ensues and gene simmons ultimately gets away but yeah the, the fact that he can murder someone and dump her body Body into this fountain and no one bats an eye feels right like that is another thing that this movie is eerily prescient about is the basic <laughs> ineffectual nature of the police gene simmons runs off after firing a couple of his little smart bullets that don't land he reaches the edge of this small waterfall and gene simmons stunt double leaps off into the air and splashes into the reflecting pool below and then tom Selleck and thompson they chase after gene simmons but gene simmons gets away so we come back to police headquarters where the chief just screams at Tom Selleck, What are you gonna do now, hotshot? Accidentally find yourself in a leather bar filled with men? That's the oldest trick in the book! But your mustache would be welcome. You know, that's what I've heard. Don't even look at me that way! You're on thin ice! And then Tom Selleck says, Well, chief, I'm not gonna do anything because, <laughs> you see, I put a tracking device on Gene Simmons and eventually he'll show up. And then there's like a knock at the door and it's Thompson and she says, Hey, it's Gene Simmons. The bug you planted on him says that he's at the hospital why don't we go get engaged on our way to the hospital i mean and then we'll get this guy what was that thing you said about getting engaged ah, it doesn't matter yeah let's go to a random bathroom they go to this hospital man there are like two dozen cops in this men's bathroom to capture gene simmons and he's what in one of the stalls taking a shit and then tom Selleck does the kick down of each door one by one turns out there's no gene simmons and he just took the electronic tracking device and stuck it into a roll of toilet paper as a decoy and everybody leaves except for sally who's in charge of investigating what the hell's going on they leave another cop at the door to make sure nobody comes into the men's room to make a poopy and then Sally hears something, Bo, and lightning oh, flashes oh. outside to create ambiance. And then she wanders to another stall, but she don't find nothing, Bo. Oh. And then one of Gene Simmons' spider robots crawls out from under a janitor's cart, climbs up the wall, onto the ceiling, drops down onto Sally, and then injects her with acid? Yeah. And then it blows up. And when it does that, it kills not only her, but that other cop that was there to keep people out from coming in to make poopies. I like this because when it jumps on her, <laughs> it's sort of like in movies where like, somebody throws a cat at somebody, like it's attacking them, but you, <gasps> but it just looks like, oh, we're just kind of underhand tossing this at them and they have to catch it. When you watch it, you can see the strings on the robot where they lowered it down. It's pretty yeah, obvious. Yeah, uh, I like that stuff. I like Goofy. <laughs> sure, it's awesome. This whole movie is pretty fantastic. Yeah, we'll get to it at the end, but and it kind of trucks. Like this movie's only like, what, 90 100 minutes something like that it's pretty quick it doesn't bullshit around a lot and it's pretty entertaining but neither here nor there so we come back to police headquarters and gene simmons dude he just shows up dressed as a police officer I'm like the balls on this guy uh -huh. he goes in and he's got a fake eyeball that grants him access to their computer system because they use a retinal scan and he pulls up tom Selleck's file and sees that tom Selleck has a son named bobby and gene simmons gives it this grinchity grin i think gene Gene Simmons could have figured out that this guy had a kid without breaking into police headquarters. Uh, maybe, but sometimes you just do it for fun, Chad. And as we've learned <laughs> because of Tom Selleck's exposition, that Gene Simmons is just an evil person that likes doing evil things because it's evil. Sure. Why would we ever see him really do any of those things? Mm. We'll just take Tom Selleck's word for it. That's the biggest problem, I think, with him as a villain is it's really just him using little toys to do his bad guy stuff until uh -huh. the end of the movie. And even then, it's mostly just more of the robots but anyway we'll get to that so tom Selleck gives the chief some shit about this half-baked stakeout of the bathroom and as he's giving him the business about that 
Thompson sees that this computer terminal that Gene Simmons was just at has Bobby's file or his picture open on the screen. This is clearly the work of Gene Simmons. If he kills your son, Tom Selleck, you can plant your seed inside me and we'll make a new Bobby. That name's gender neutral. So it would work for a boy or a girl. I'm as fertile as the Tennessee Valley. <laughs> Tom Selleck tries to call his home to make sure that everything is okay and he wants to check in with Lois the robot, but call waiting and voicemail wasn't invented yet. So he gets a visiting signal. And then Tom Selleck and Thompson, they rush to Tom Selleck's house and they enter and lightning flashes outside to provide some more ambience of a threatening scene. And then Tom Selleck and Thompson, they rush in and both they find Lois smashed up on the ground, muttering the word air, air, air. Yeah, it's a real <laughs> daisy, daisy. <laughs> Thompson says, I didn't do this. Sure, I wanted to kill Lois, but I didn't do it. Tom Selleck, all we need to do is burn any photos of you and your wife, you know, the one who died in the car accident, that I had nothing to do with, by the way, and then our life together can begin. You know, this isn't the way I planned it, but huh, life has a funny way of turning out. Also, I hate those window treatments and we need to remodel this kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> this refrigerator has to go all my life i've wanted a smart fridge and a man and anyway so lois finally starts working bobby was on the phone with an extremely unpleasant man who came in the back door that 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 that's what she said also the hot dog cleaner I, i'm afraid is only at 30 percent capacity oh my god lois don't tell me that what else do you know about this horrible man and lois says speaking of unpleasant your skank partner is here with you. This is the opposite of a surprise. What is the word? Disappointment? And then Tom Selleck says, Lois, quit berating my partner. Tell me what happened to Bobby. Where's this strange man? Was he a homeowner? Is he 62 years and older? Is he interested in a reverse mortgage? And Lois says, the man forced Bobby to leave with him. And then Lois goes all wonky and starts just spewing a bunch of nonsense. And then the phone rings and it's Gene Simmons. Hey, listen, sucker. That's my thing. I call people sucker. If you want to see your boy bobby alive bring the other computer chip templates to super tall building construction site only you should come or i'm gonna kill your one and only son bobby help me dad shut up and then thompson jumps in and she says tom Selleck, where are we going we can talk about our wedding reception menu on the way there he said that only i should go and he'll know if you're there whatever you do thompson do not show up for the finale of this movie promise me that okay i won't and then as soon as he walks out the door she's like look lois i don't like you and you don't like me <laughs> but i've got to save that man of ours and his irritating son so i need you to play the call <laughs> from gene simmons sure enough it, a last gasp of lois almost where she's like playing this voicemail and you hear gene simmons saying meet me at Shantisu. i know where that is that's right next to the super tall building construction site thompson's on the way to save the day -da -da -ba -ba it's also right across the street from johnson's bridal gowns i can save <laughs> tom Selleck, take him right next door get my dress we can be married by 2 a.m oh this is the perfect plan let's see what happens so tom Selleck shows up at this construction site and there's like five or six robot spiders next to this open air service elevator there's also a tv monitor where gene simmons and bobby can be seen from on a higher level floor and bobby says are you you here to see me dad like you did that baby earlier but not that woman who's gonna eventually play rebecca on the hits tv sitcom cheers she died dad save me like the baby not like rebecca and gene simmons says shut up kid tom Selleck, bring me the computer templates and drop your gun and get on the elevator right into the top show your unease because remember you're afraid of heights the thing that's crazy about this man is this is what 10 minutes before the movie is done like there is very little left of those 10 minutes two and a half are in credits yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah we're barreling towards the end and yeah there are these little spider robots all over the place but if you got on an elevator that didn't have walls and you were truly afraid of heights mm -hmm. taking you up 30 flights into the air would be paralyzing i'm not afraid of heights but if you put me in this elevator box i 
I would be freaked out, man. Absolutely. And I am somewhat afraid of heights. It's not crippling or anything. It's not on stairs or anything like that. It's more like right. unsecured heights, like rope bridges or cherry pickers and that kind of thing that really freaks me out. But yeah, right. this open air elevator would absolutely do a number on me. So when he goes up, he gets there, Gene Simmons just throws Bobby at him. Like, take this yeah. kid. He's irritating as hell. Put him on the elevator. Push the down button. It's the one with the arrow that points towards the ground. Which is what happens. He starts heading down. And, and Tom Selleck says, I'm not going to hand over these templates, pal. Not until my uh, questionable son, Bobby, is down at the bottom and safe. Gene Simmons says, oh, about that. Well, those spiders aren't going to hurt anybody that gets in the elevator but they are programmed to kill the first person who gets off the elevator <laughs> which is pretty good it's a pretty good plan i've also got some t-shirts for sale that say i got killed by robot spiders because i was the first one who got off the elevator and all i got was this lousy t-shirt they're suitable for burying your son if you're interested <laughs> tom Selleck is yelling down the shaft like bobby stop the elevator stop the elevator and he's like i'm yeah. trying it dad but the buttons don't work and so Gene Simmons <laughs> is just like, hey, Tom Selleck, have you ever seen somebody die right in front of you? <laughs> And as Bobby reaches the last few floors, Thompson shows up, runs towards the elevator, screaming, don't worry, Bobby, mama's here to save you. You, your dad, and me, your new and better mom, we're going to be happy again in a home without Lois or any photos of anybody else that you used to call mom that used to hang on the walls. Did your dad tell you we're getting new window treatments and we're remodeling the kitchen and the bathrooms? Well, we are, son. And then she just jumps onto the elevator, helps Bobby. Bobby climb up onto the top of the elevator away from the robot spiders and they just climb up one floor and they then hit the button on the elevator this is all exposes a real flaw in gene simmons plan that anybody could have just hopped off the elevator onto a floor that's not the ground floor to exploit the acid spider robot treatment well he wasn't looking for this lady to show up to sort of hijack this kid at the last minute right. in fairness to him it's the cost of of hubris right pride goeth before a fall gene simmons fires a few bullets at tom Selleck, and they miss and i was like why aren't you using your magic heat seeking bullets that seems to be a real oversight on the part of gene simmons evil mastermind extraordinaire i don't know if it's that like he doesn't have the right signature to target him or something it's just lazy writing, but uh, whatever. Yeah. So Tom Selleck dodges all these bullets. Hey, ho! Did you like the part where he runs over and turns that big wheel, either opening or closing the main Dude, drain? He's always wanted to do that. The though. exact notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely how do you not look at that and not think i'm either opening or closing the main drain but it obscures everything in steam which makes basically gives him some cover uh -huh. and so tom Selleck gets in this elevator and takes it all the way to the top floor to kind yeah. of regroup or whatever i guess so he's looking over the side and freaking out some more because he's even higher now in this open air elevator yeah. and this scene i don't think it's perfect but i really really like the fact that there's no music there's very little sound and it's just tom Selleck in this elevator as these robot spiders are crawling all over it and you can just hear their me metallic clicking counterpoint this scene is terrible because <laughs> because tom Selleck hits the down button his pants are full of shit he's got to be terrified uh -huh. but the elevator's busted and he sees on this control panel display that there is a reset button that some sadistic engineer placed on the bottom of the elevator. Mm -hmm. This would be like putting the combination dial for a safe inside the door of the safe. This makes no sense at all. And as these robots come up, this is the most implausible thing in the entire movie because we've seen that Tom Selleck is terrified of heights, but here he just climbs onto the outside of this elevator that is attached to the outside of this construction site. He's like 50 stories up in the air and he pulls off this ninja warrior level of physical feats 
feats that require upper body strength of which oh. I can only dream. I would have fallen immediately. I would have been dead in two seconds. I'm like, okay, legs are off, waist is off, arms like, ah! Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as more of me was over the side than not, I was, yeah, I would like be done. Like 51%, <laughs> right. that's yeah, like dead. 50.3%, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> But he does, he climbs up. This is a man who cannot function at heights. He's dangling from this thing like Donkey Kong Jr. Smacking this button to get the elevator to lower him back down to the safety of planet Earth. The elevator's going down. He pulls himself back up into the elevator after skirting all these robots but spiders and knocking them off and whatnot. Yeah. And so when he gets there, Gene Simmons is there grinning, waiting for him, stands over him, like climbs on this elevator, stands over him. Well, it's time to die, Tom Selleck. And before you do, let me offer you some Gene Simmons brand headstones. <laughs> also, I've got a couple of coffins that I think you might enjoy. Really elegant. Right. And so Tom Selleck then hits the button on the elevator, which sends them kind of rocketing back down towards the bottom bottom floor but Tom Selleck hits the button to stop the elevator just short so that it topples Gene Simmons out of the elevator and onto the ground. And he falls anywhere from 10 to 300 feet. <laughs> right. And <laughs> as Gene Simmons himself told us, hey, as soon as somebody lands on the ground, these robot spiders are going to go after him, which is what happens. He gets enveloped by these robot spiders that hit him with the acid. And, and you're like, ah, oh, he hoisted by his own petard his plan worked all too well but all too well and thompson brings tom Selleck up the rest of the way down and bobby and tom Selleck hug dad i'm here with uh, mom yeah all right <laughs> how about we hug once briefly now you go to the car i need to talk to this lady about some stuff immediately just sends him out of the movie get out of here yeah he's gone yeah you're dragging the narrative down Tom Selleck does walk over to Gene Simmons to check his vitals to make sure he's really, really dead. Mm -hmm. Gene Simmons pops up with this hissing jump scare, and then Gene Simmons really, really dies. They all start exploding on him, and he is for sure dead now. So Tom Selleck goes back over to Thompson, who says, You look awful. You know, I have to say, I've overcome my fear of heights. <laughs> and... <laughs> And Tops is like, hey, big guy, how about you take me to dinner? Well, just because you're a woman, that shouldn't make any difference, right? That's the thing I said earlier. And she's like, I agree. And then he says, crazily, can you cook? Uh -huh. And she says, try me. And then they kiss. But they don't just kiss. They open mouth kiss for two minutes. Uh-huh. While the credits start rolling, he gets to second base as you watch these two adults make out while sparks fall in the background. It is uncomfortable watching these two have foreplay. While that's happening, it's like Roy Hobbs hit a homer because yeah. there are sparks falling down all around them. And the music is this generic version of the greatest American hero theme. Mm -hmm. It's strange. It's really weird that the movie ends in this place. The end. Yeah. And that's, that's Runaway. Totally. So let's talk about this because we've both been kind of dancing around the fact that I think both of us kind of like this movie. Yes, but filtered through the right perspective. Like, is it good? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. Is it hokey and goofy and fun to watch? Absolutely. Is it the best of this season? I don't know. We'll get there. We got yeah. movies to go. But uh, here's what I will say in defense of Runaway. And this is something that I, I haven't mentioned to you yet, but I saw this movie because it was on HBO a bunch when I was a kid. So I uh -huh. probably saw Runaway no less than a dozen times. It was just one of those movies every now and again I would go back to. And the reason was is because I think Gene Simmons makes actually a pretty good villain. I mean, he basically just glares in the movie, but he's pretty good right. at that. And I do think that Tom Selleck is a pretty good lead. I truly thought that this was a made-for-TV movie until I watched it for this season. It's somewhere in the back of my head, I would filed it away, things like North and South and Lonesome Dove and, and Runaway. That was just, Tom Selleck was a TV guy. This was a made-for-TV movie. So I'd never seen it until we did it for this season. I think it's a good time. Again, it's steeped in 80s stuff. There's some problematic material and just goofy 80s kind of movie business. But 
but all the futurist stuff it's kind of fun to see almost 40 years ago now what Mm -hmm. this movie got right and it's a surprising amount like michael crichton really did have a pretty good handle on hey here's what the near future of technology will be i feel like that the action sequences in this all fall short they're just not quite there yet yeah i don't think michael crichton is a very good director at the end of the day I agree with that. He's not terrible, but it's very workmanlike. And if there had just been a touch of flair to this movie, of directorial flair, and a little less just kind of straightforward goofiness. You get some better cinematographers and directors of photography. They could have bolstered this and made it a little bit better than it was. But it's still fun. I I don't know if it's the best thing we're going to watch this season, but it's a sight better than at least a couple of the movies we've talked about so far. So. (laughs) without a doubt yeah. and Bo, i gotta say you cannot do a season of pick six movies that's focused on michael crichton and not discuss the topic of dinosaurs eating people so Bo, i present for the finale of this season we are going to be taking on a movie that was inspired by a book that was inspired by a movie that was inspired by a book that was inspired by a screenplay what does all of that mean it means we're going to be talking about the lost world World, colon jurassic park a movie that was inspired by the book the lost world which was inspired by the success of the movie jurassic park which was inspired by the book jurassic park which it turns out Bo was inspired by a screenplay that michael crichton wrote that's a real ouroboros that we've got going on here but i have seen this movie a couple of times and, and in fact recently watched it in preparation for this and I know a lot of people love these Jurassic Park movies and they have a lot of fondness for them, but let's just call it what it is. The Lost World is a big stinker. It was a book that only existed because of the success of the film Jurassic Park. And the movie, The Lost World, colon Jurassic Park, only exists because of the success of the movie Jurassic Park. And it feels that way. There is no burning desire to bring this to the screen. I've said this before on this show. I think the original Jurassic Park, the movie, and the book quite frankly i think both of those are imperfect but really wonderful and this is a pale the opposite of that it's just such a pale imitation there are people who care but those people are richard schiff seems to be really going for it and maybe it's like chubby checkers let's twist again yes (laughs) yes it is the let's twist again of dinosaur movies so without waking up your grandparents or your great grandparents or great grandparents to understand that reference we're just gonna call <laughs> call it an episode as always if you like pick six movies please like rate review recommend us to a friend you can email us at pick six movies at gmail.com you can find us on social media here and there bertram has three or four weeks left i think as an intern so we will see what he has to offer in the coming weeks i'm sure between he and all of the other dope smoking fiends on our staff they will uh, continue to deliver us some of the uh, most uh, lackluster work that we've seen in, mm-hmm. in months. So, Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the film Runaway for this season? I'm rebuilding Lois. Hot dog cleaner first. Dad, that's not where your... Oh, that is where your hot dog goes. Dad, you're my hero. Now you get it, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Come back and see us in two weeks' times, everybody, as we will be presenting you with the Lost World colon the Lost the Lost World the Lost World the Lost, the lost World, world in my colon, colon the Lost World colon Jurassic Park. We'll see you in two weeks' time, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>